Hi, I'm Marty Nimco. I've always had a dog, love dogs, and I've always been a fan of the short story. Well, the intersection of the two resides in veterinarian James Herriot's book, Dog Stories. It consists of 50 wonderfully told stories, and my favorite of the 50 is one called Mrs. Donovan. It's appropriate for adults and for kids probably maybe seven or older, something like that. Any, any kid who's kind of aware that there's life and then there's death, the cycle. The silvery-haired old gentleman with the pleasant face didn't look the type to be easily upset, but his eyes glared at me angrily, and his lips quivered with indignation. Mr. Harriet, he said, I've come to make a complaint. I strongly object to your callousness in subjecting my dog to unnecessary suffering. Suffering? What suffering? I was mystified. I think you know, Mr. Harriet. I brought my dog in a few days ago. He was very lame, and I am referring to your treatment on that occasion. I nodded. Yeah, I remember it well, but where does the suffering come in? Well, the poor animal is going around with his leg dangling, and I should have it on good authority that the bone is fractured and should have been put into plaster immediately. The old gentleman stuck out his chin fiercely. All right, you can stop worrying, I said. Your dog has a radial paralysis caused by a blow on the ribs, and if you are patient and follow my treatment, he will gradually improve. In fact, I think he'll recover completely. But he trails his legs when he walks. I know, that's typical, and to the layman, it does give the appearance of a broken leg. But he shows no sign of pain, does he? Uh, no, he seems quite happy, but the, this lady seems absolutely sure of her facts. She was adamant. Lady? Yeah, said the old gentleman. She's uh, clever with animals, and, and she came around to see if she could help my dog's convalescence. She brought some excellent condition powders with her. Ah, a blinding shaft pierced the fog in my mind. All was suddenly clear. It was Mrs. Donovan, wasn't it? Well, uh, yes, that, that was her name. Old Mrs. Donovan was a woman who really got around, no matter what was going on in Darby, weddings, funerals, house sales, you'll find that dumpy little figure and walnut face among the spectators, the darting black button eyes taking everything in. And as always, on the end of her lead, her terrier dog. When I say old, I'm only guessing, because she appeared ageless. She seemed to be around a long time, but she could have been anywhere between 55 and 75. She certainly had the vitality of a young woman, because she must have walked long distances to her declared quest to keep abreast of events. Many people took an uncharitable view of her acute curiosity, but whatever the motivation, her activities took her into almost every channel of life in the town. One of these channels was our veterinary practice. Because Mrs. Donovan, among her other widely ranging uh, interests, was an animal doctor. In fact, I think it would be safe to say that this facet of her life transcended all the others. She could talk at length on the ailments of small animals, and she had a whole armory of medicines and remedies at her command, her two specialties being her miracle working condition powders and a dog shampoo of unprecedented value for improving the coat. She had an uncanny ability to sniff out a sick animal, and it was not uncommon when I was on my rounds to find Mrs. Donovan's uh, dark gypsy face poised intently over what I thought was my patient while she administered calf's foot jelly or one of her own patent nostrums. I suffered more than my boss Siegfried because I took a more active part in the small animal side of our practice. I was anxious to develop this aspect and to improve my image in this field, and Mrs. Donovan didn't help at all. <clears throat> Young Mr. Harriet, she would confide to my clients, he is all right with cattle and such like, but uh, he doesn't know nothing about dogs and cats. And of course they believed her and had implicit faith in her. She had that irresistible mystic appeal of the amateur, and on top of that there was her habit, particularly endearing in Darby, 
of never charging for her advice, nor her medicines, nor her long periods of diligent nursing. Older folk in the town told how her husband, an Irish farm worker, had died many years ago, and how he must have had a bit put away, because Mrs. Donovan had apparently been able to indulge all her interests over the years without financial strain. Since she inhabited the streets of Darby all day and every day, I often encountered her, and she always smiled up at me sweetly and told me how she had been sitting up all night with Mrs. So-and-so's dog that I had been treating. She felt sure she'd be able to pull it through. Well, there was no smile on her face, however, on the day when she rushed into my office while Sir, my boss Siegfried and I were having tea. Mr. Harriet, she gasped, can, can, can you come? My, my little dog's been run over. I jumped up and ran out into the car with her. She sat in the passenger seat with her head bowed, her hands clasped tightly on her knees. He slipped his collar and ran in front of a car. He's flying in front of the school, halfway up Cliff and Rose. Please hurry. I was there within three minutes, but as I bent over the dusty little body stretched on the pavement, I knew there was nothing I could do. The fast glazing eyes, the faint gasping respirations, the ghastly pallor of the mucous membranes all told the same story. I'll take him back to the surgery and get some saline into him, Mrs. Donovan, I said, but I'm afraid he's had a massive internal hemorrhage. Did you see what happened exactly? She gulped. Yes, the wheel went right over him. Ruptured liver for sure. I passed my hands under the little animal and began to lift him gently. But as I did, so the breathing stopped and the eyes stared fixedly ahead. Mrs. Donovan sank to her knees and for a few moments, she gently stroked the rough hair of the head and chest. He's dead, isn't he? She whispered at last. I'm afraid he is, I said. She got slowly to her feet and stood bewilderedly among the uh, little group of bystanders on the pavement. Her lips moved, but she seemed unable to say any more. I took her arm, led her over to the car and opened the door. Go in and sit down, I said. I'll, I'll run you home. Leave everything to me. I wrapped the dog in my spare pair of overalls and laid him in the boot, that's the trunk in Britain language, before driving away. It wasn't until we drew up outside of Mrs. Donovan's house that she began to weep. I sat there without speaking until she had finished. Then she wiped her eyes and turned to me. Do you think he suffered at all? I'm certain he didn't. It was all so quick. He wouldn't know a thing about it. She tried to smile. Poor little Rex. I don't know what I'm going to do without him. We've traveled a few miles together, you know. Yes, you have. He had a wonderful life, Mrs. Donovan. And let me give you a bit of advice. You must get another dog. You'd be lost without one. She shook her head. No, I couldn't. That little dog meant so much to me. I couldn't let another take his place. Well, I know how that's how you feel just now, but I wish you'd think about it. I don't want to seem callous. I tell everybody this when they lose an animal, and I know it's good advice. Mr. Harriet, I'll never have another one. She shook her head again very decisively. Rex was my faithful friend for many years, and I just want to remember him. He is the last dog I'll ever have. I often saw Mrs. Donovan around the town after this, and I was glad to see she was still as active as ever, though she looked strangely incomplete without the little dog on its lead. But it must have been over a month before I had a chance to speak to her. It was on the afternoon that Inspector Halliday of the SPCA rang me. Oh, Mr. Harriet, I'd like you to come over and see an animal with me, a cruelty case. Right. What is it? A dog, and it's pretty grim. Dreadful case of neglect. He gave me the name of a row of old brick cottages down by the river and said he'd meet me there. Halliday was waiting for me, smart and businesslike in his dark uniform, and I pulled up in the back lane behind the houses. He was a big blonde man with cheerful blue eyes, and he didn't smile as he came over to the car. He's in here, 
he said, and led the way toward one of the doors in the long, crumbling wall. A few curious people were hanging around, and with a feeling of inevitability, I recognized a gnome-like brown face. Trust Mrs. Donovan, I thought, to be among those present at a time like this. We went through the door into the long garden. I had found that even the lowliest dwellings in Darby had long strips of land at the back, as though the builders had taken for granted that the country people who were going to live in them would want to occupy themselves with the pursuits of the soil, with vegetable and fruit growing, even stock keeping in a small way. You usually found a pig there, a few hens, often pretty beds of flowers. But this garden was a wilderness. A chilling air of desolation hung over the few gnarled apple and plum trees standing among a tangle of rank grass, as though the place had been forsaken by all living creatures. Halliday went over to a ramshackle wooden shed with peeling paint and a rusted corrugated iron roof. He produced a key, unlocked the padlock, and dragged the door partly open. There was no window, and it wasn't easy to identify the jumble inside. Broken gardening tools, an ancient mangle, rows of flower pots and partly used paint tins, and right at the back, a dog sitting quietly. I didn't notice him immediately because of the gloom and because the smell in the shed started me coughing. But as I drew closer, I saw that he was a big animal, sitting very upright, his collar secured by a chain to a ring in the wall. I had seen some thin dogs, but this advanced emaciation reminded me of my textbooks on anatomy. Nowhere else did the bones of pelvis, face, and rib cage stand out with such horrifying clarity. A deep, smoothed-out hollow in the earth, earth floor showed where he had lain, moved about, in fact lived, for a very long time. The sight of the animal <clears throat> had a stupefying effect on me. I had only took in the rest of the scene, half took in the rest of the scene, the filthy shreds of sacking scattered nearby, the bowl of scummy water. Look at the back end, Halliday murdered, muttered. I carefully raised the dog from his sitting position and realized that the stench in the place was not entirely due to the piles of excrement. The hindquarters were a welter of pressure sores, which had turned gangrenous, and strips of sloughing tissue hung down from there. There were similar sores along the sternum and ribs. The coat, which seemed to be a dull yellow, was matted and caked with dirt. The inspector spoke again. I don't think he's ever been out of here. He's only a young dog, about a year old. But I understand he's been in that shed since he was an eight-week-old pup. Someone out in the lane heard a whimper or he never would have been found. I felt a tightening of the throat and a sudden nausea which wasn't due to the smell. It was the thought of this patient animal sitting starved and forgotten in the darkness and filth for a year. I looked again at the dog and saw in his eyes only a calm trust. Some dogs would have barked their heads off and soon been discovered. Some would have become terrified and vicious. But this was one of the totally undemanding kind, the kind that had complete faith in people and accepted all their actions without complaint. Just an occasional whimper, perhaps as he sat interminably in the empty blackness which had been his world and at times wondered what it was all about. Well, Inspector, I hope you're going to throw the book at whoever's responsible, I said. Halliday grunted. Oh, there won't be much done. It's a case of diminished responsibility. The owner is definitely simple. Lives with his aged mother, who hardly knows what's going on either. I've seen the fellow, and it seems he threw a bit of food in when he felt like it, and that's about all he did. <clears throat> They'll find him and stop him keeping an animal in the future, but nothing more than that. I see. I reached out and stroked the dog's head, and he immediately responded by resting a paw on my wrist. There was a pathetic dignity about the way he held himself erect, the calm eyes regarding me, friendly and unafraid. Well, you'll let me know if you want me in court. Of course, and thank you for coming along. 
Halliday hesitated for a moment. And now I'll expect you're going to want to put this poor thing out of his misery right away. I continued to run my hand over the head and ears while I thought for a moment. Yes, yes, I suppose so. We would never find a home for him in this state. It's the kindest thing to do. Anyway, push the door wide open, will you, so that I can get a proper look at him? In the improved light, I examined him more thoroughly. Perfect teeth, well-proportioned limbs with a fringe of yellow hair. I put my stethoscope on his chest, and as I listened to the slow, strong thudding of the heart, the dog again put his paw on my hand. I turned to Halliday. You know, Inspector? Inside this bag of bones, there's a lovely, healthy golden retriever. I wish there was some way of letting him out. As I spoke, I noticed there was more than one figure in the door opening. A pair of black pebble eyes were peering intently at the big dog from behind the inspector's broad back. The other spectators had remained in the lane, but Mrs. Donovan's curiosity had been too much for her. I continued conversationally, as though I hadn't seen her. You know, Halliday, what this dog first needs is a good shampoo to clean up his matted coat. Huh? said Halliday. Yes, and then he wants a long course of some really good condition powders. What's that? The inspector looked startled. There's no doubt about it, I said. It's the only hope for him, but where are you going to find such things? Really good enough. I sighed and straightened up. Oh, well, I suppose there's nothing else to do. I better put him to sleep right away. I'll get the things from my car. When I got back to the shed, Mrs. Donovan was already inside examining the dog despite the feeble remonstrances of the big man. Look, she said excitedly, pointing to a name roughly scratched on the collar. His name is Roy. She smiled up at me. It's a bit like Rex, isn't it, that name? You know, Mrs. Donovan, now that you mention it, it is. It's very like Rex, the way it comes off your tongue. I nodded seriously. She stood silent for a few moments, obviously in the grip of deep emotion, and then burst out. Can I have him? I can make him better. I know I can. Please, please let me have him. Well, I don't know, I said. It's uh, really up to the inspector. You'll have to get his permission. Halliday looked at her in bewilderment and then said, uh, Excuse me, madam, and drew me to one side. We walked a few yards through the long grass and stopped under a tree. Mr. Harriet, he whispered, I don't know what's going on here, but I just can't pass over an animal in this condition to anyone who has a casual whim. The poor beggars had one bad break already. I think that's enough. This woman doesn't look like a suitable person. I held up a hand. Believe me, Inspector, you have nothing to worry about. She is a funny old stick. But she's been sent from heaven today. If anybody in Darrowby can give this dog a new life, it's her. Halliday still looked very doubtful. Oh, but I still don't get it. What was all that stuff about him needing shampoos and condition powder? Oh, never mind about that. I'll tell you some other time. What he needs is lots of good food, care, and affection. And that's just what he'll get. You can take my word for it. All right, you seem very sure. Halliday looked at me for a second or two, then turned and walked over to the eager little figure by the shed. I had never before been deliberately on the lookout for Mrs. Donovan. She had just cropped up wherever. I happened to be, wherever I happened to be, but now I scanned the streets of Darrowby, anxiously, day by day, without sighting her. I didn't like it when Gobber Newhouse got drunk and drove his bicycle determinedly through a barrier into a ten-foot hole where they were laying the new sewer, and Mrs. Donovan was not in evidence among the happy crowd who watched the council workmen and two policemen trying to get him out, and when she was nowhere to be seen when they had to fetch the fire engine to the fish and chips shop the night the fat burst in the flames, I became seriously worried. Maybe I should have called around to, to see how she was getting on with that dog, or called, called round. 
Certainly I had trimmed off the necrotic tissue and dressed the, store, the sores before she took him away, but perhaps he needed something more than that. And yet at the time I felt a strong connection with that main, that the main thing was to get him out of there and clean him and feed him and nature would do the rest. And I had a lot of faith in Mrs. Donovan, far more than she had in me, when it came to animal doctoring. It was hard to believe I had been completely wrong. It must have been nearly three weeks, and I was on the point of calling at her home when I noticed her stumping briskly along the far side of the marketplace, peering closely into every shop window exactly as before. The only difference? She had a big yellow dog on the end of the lead. I turned the wheel and set my car bumping over the cobbles until I was abreast of her. When she saw me getting out, she stopped and smiled impishly. But she didn't speak as I bent over Roy and examined him. He was still a skinny dog, but he looked bright and happy, and his wounds were healthy and granulating, and there was not a speck of dirt in his coat or on his skin. I knew then what Mrs. Donovan had been doing all this time. She had been washing and combing and teasing at that filthy tangle until she had finally conquered it. As I straightened up, she seized my wrist in a grip of surprising strength and looked up into my eyes. Now, Mr. Harriet, she said, haven't I made a difference to this dog? You've done wonders, Mrs. Donovan, I said, and you have been at him with that marvelous shampoo of yours, haven't you? She giggled and walked away, and from that day I saw the two of them frequently, but at a distance, and something like two months went by before I had a chance to talk to her again. She was passing by my office as I was coming down the steps, and again she grabbed my wrist. Mr. Harriet, she said, just as she had done before, haven't I made a difference to this dog? I looked down at Roy with something akin to awe. He had grown and filled out, and his coat, no longer yellow, but a rich gold, lay in luxuriant shining swaths over the well-fleshed ribs and back. A new brightly studded collar glittered on his neck and his tail, beautifully fringed, fanned the air gently. He was now a golden retriever in full magnificence. As I stared at him, he reared up, plunked his forepaws on my chest, and looked into my face, and in his eyes I read plainly the same calm affection and trust I had seen back in that black shed. Mrs. Donovan, I said softly, he is the most beautiful dog in Yorkshire. Then, because I knew she was waiting for it, it's those wonderful condition powders. Whatever do you put in them? <laughs> ah, wouldn't you like to know? She bridled and smiled up and coquettishly, and indeed she was nearer being kissed at that moment than she had for many years. I suppose you could say that that was the start of Roy's second life. And as the years passed, I often pondered on the beneficent providence which had decreed that an animal that had spent his first 12 months abandoned and unwanted, staring uncomprehendingly into that unchanging, stinking darkness, should be whisked in a moment into an existence of light and movement and love because I didn't think any dog had it quite as good as Roy did from then on. His diet changed dramatically, from odd bread crusts to best stewing steak and biscuit, meaty bones, and a bowl of warm milk every evening. And he never missed a thing. Garden, fets, school, sports, evictions, gymkhanas, he'd be there. I was pleased to note that as time went on, Mrs. Donovan seemed to be clocking up an even greater daily mileage. Her expenditure on shoe leather must have been phenomenal. But of course, it was absolute joy for Roy. A busy round in the morning, home for a meal, then straight out again, it was all go. Mrs. Donovan didn't confine her activities to the town center. There was a big stretch of common land down by the river where there were seats and people used to take their dogs for a gallop and she liked to get down there fairly regularly to check on the latest developments on the domestic scene. 
I often saw Roy loping majestically over the grass among a pack of assorted canines, and when he wasn't doing that, he was submitting to being stroked or patted or generally fussed over. He was handsome, and he just liked people. That combination made him irresistible. It was common knowledge that his mistress had bought a whole selection of brushes and combs of various sizes with which she labored over his coat. Some people said that she had a little brush for his teeth too, and it might have been true, but he certainly wouldn't need his nails clipped. His life on the roads would keep them down. Mrs. Donovan too had her reward. She had a faithful companion by her side every hour of the day and night, but there was more to it than that. She always had the compulsion to help and heal animals. And the salvation of Roy was the high point of her life, a blazing triumph which never dimmed. I know the memory of it was always fresh because many years later I was sitting on the sidelines at a cricket match and I saw the two of them, the old lady glancing keenly around her, Roy gazing placidly out at the field of play apparently enjoying every ball. At the end of the match, I watched them move away with the dispersing crowd. Roy would have been about 12 then, and heaven only knows how old Mrs. Donovan must have been. But the big golden animal was trotting along effortlessly, and his mistress, a little more bent perhaps, and her head rather nearer the ground, was going very well. When she saw me, she came over, and I felt the familiar tight grip on my wrist. Mr. Harriet, she said, and in the dark probing eyes, the pride was still as warm, the triumph still as bursting new as if it had just happened yesterday. Mr. Harriet, haven't I made a difference to this dog? Mrs. Donovan's dedicated care was rewarded with many years of loyal companionship, and Roy, despite his bad start in life, lived well into his teens. After his death, Mrs. Donovan went to live in an old folks home in our town. I always tried to disguise my characters, but she recognized herself and rejoiced. She was so proud to be in my book. The salvation of Roy and the wonderful transformation in his appearance and his entire life is one of my warmest memories. And of course, a triumph by an amateur healer has a special glamour. Anyway, that is the story Mrs. Donovan by the inimitable veterinarian and uh, writer, James Harriet. Um, anyway, I'm Marty Nemco. Uh, I thank you for watching. I welcome your thumbs up and um, accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your uh, uh, comments and uh, especially like it if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel which mainly consists of my self-help advice around career, relationships, money, even the meaning of life, um, which I think reading stories like this and listening to them is part of. Um, and occasionally I punctuate my piano playing and reading the wonderful works of other people. In any event, I do thank you for watching. I'm Marty Nepco.